Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of This Week in Cloud Native. This is episode number nine. Um, and in the previous episode, we spent quite a bit of time kind of exploring the um, a lot of the information about the pod security con admission controller. Um, and in this episode, we're going to do a little bit more hands on there. So let me know you're out there if you're out there, and I will be happy to raise your voice into the comments. So if you're listening or if you're tuned in, definitely let me know that that's happening. Good to see five of you out there. <clears throat> the HackMD for this episode is located at the link below where it says hackmd.io slash at TWICN. And so if you want to see the notes or if you want to put anything in there, you can put that stuff there. How's it going, Russ? Good to see you. And let's dig in here. So yeah, Russ saying hello to everybody. And then here is our notes for this week. Got some good stuff to cover. I'm doing some work and some, you know, pre-work and getting ready for KubeCon. I will be down there in person. So I hope that some of you will be as well. And hopefully we'll get to see each other. That'd be tremendous. Let me turn that a little bit. Looks like I got kind of off center somehow. Stream title seems off. Should say this week in Cloud Native. Search magic. Interesting. Because according to where I usually set that, that's set correctly. Huh. Interesting, interesting. Let me take a look here and see if there's something I can do there. Give me one moment. Yeah, sure enough, it is it is not correct, but I don't know how to change it because the place where I've normally changed it, it's already set correctly. So I'm not sure where to make the change. Hmm. Guess we're gonna have to fix it in post. All right, well, thank you for pointing it out at least. I don't know exactly how to change that. I think it's already set correctly on my side. So yeah, it's already. Yeah, everything I can do on my side is correct. Sorry about that. Anyway, let's dig into it a little bit more. So as you are already aware, this is Cloud Native TV. This is a uh, official live stream of the CNCF. And so it's subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Um, if you like the stuff that I'm putting out here, make sure that we're that you're throwing in the, um, uh, that you subscribe to this channel and you'll be notified when things are coming. We're trying to still figure out the calendar things you can actually schedule ahead of time, but that's taking a little bit of time. Um, if you want to see any recorded sessions, like if you missed an episode or if you want to check something out, you can actually go check out the YouTube streams. And this is where a lot of the recordings that we're doing will be here. So here's a bunch of the stuff from before the, the last week and the week before, but each of these curated playlists will actually have the content from the previous, from the previous shows. Actually, it looks like some of mine are missing. I'll have to figure out what's happening. Oh, that's the Cloud Native Classroom. Sorry. So, yeah. If you want to see a previous episode, that'll be there. For the Kubernetes side of things, there were a couple of good articles or a couple of good things that happened, including this one from Celeste Hogan. Celeste is a good friend uh, from the community and points out that there's a really great list of um, first projects uh, or first, you know, good first, good first items inside of the Kubernetes docs. And I wanted to kind of share with you how to both define them and also to uh, be able to, you know, how do you get involved, right? And so if you go to go.kates.io slash good dash first dash issue, and that's this URL right here, go.kates.io slash good dash first dash issue. And you're going to see any issues that are in the Kubernetes repository that are marked help wanted and or good first issue. Um, and these are great for getting started. And if you wanted to look for a particular category, you could jump into, um, you could look for, you could look right in here and there's lots of good stuff in here for, for 
for good first issues. And so this is a great place to start if you want to start getting involved in side of the Kubernetes in, um, environment. And there's definitely stuff that is like e easy for some and hard for others. Like there's one that is uh, talking about like the some of the Korean translations for the documentation is incorrect. And that's a great first issue for someone who speaks Korean. It would be very easy. It would likely be very simple for them, but it would not be very easy for somebody like myself who does not speak that language. Um, yeah, there's some stuff in the perf test. There's stuff in Cube Builder. There's stuff in the hierarchical namespaces. There's there's tons of stuff in here, including stuff for docs. So great place to get involved. Uh, there's actually also just recently a thread um, on the Kubernetes uh, Twitter bot, which is K8's contributors. And so if you want to follow K8's contributors, there's always good information coming from K8's contributors regarding uh, things that are happening inside the community. They'll announce that like the, the summits coming up and those sorts of things. But they also call out right here information about um, other things that are looking for the other folks, other parts of the Kubernetes community that are looking for contribution. So here's an example of building an intuitive dashboard. Um, so if you're if you're if you'd like to play with AngularJS, Golang, and Client Go, SIG UI is looking for for such contributors to help them build an intuitive dashboard. More information here. And there are a few other call outs just this last week around things that are around folks that are looking for uh, feedback there as well. So I go ahead and retweet those. And if you're following me on Twitter, you'll see those retweets as well. So SIG Cluster Lifecycle is looking for contributors to help us with etcd ADM, which is a neat project. It's basically a tooling that automates the lifecycle of etcd within your cluster, cluster add-ons in kubeadm. Are you a user or looking for a way to give back? Click here for more information. Also, we have SIG Scheduling looking for contributors to help document scheduler internals. Um, they're looking for more folks in the SIG auto scaling. They're looking for more. And then here's what I was referring to earlier. If you're considering registering for the Contributor Summit at the upcoming KubeCon virtually or in person, please register ASAP. If you haven't done that, or if you plan on actually attending KubeCon either virtually or in person, definitely check that out. It would be a really good time. So yeah, great Twitter bot for following what's, what's happening kind of in the community and getting updated that way. The next thing up usually is we cover a security announce. It looks like I have some other chat. Some kind of bot would be nice with posts, clickable links. Well, Duffy talked about them. That would be neat. Yeah, something maybe I'll build live. That'd be kind of fun. So we have Kubernetes CVEs. Usually I check out the announce group, which there's nothing in here since July 14th. So that's good. No big new security announcements. I did find another dashboard that I wanted to share with you all, but because I thought that this would probably be a good source of information as well. I'm not sure that everybody is aware, but Kubernetes has actually um, formed a relationship with HackerOne and they have a bug bounty program. And it was launched in January of 2020. Um, <clears throat> which feels like it was a million years ago and only yesterday at the same time. So this is the kind of activity list. And I think you can sort by when it was published or when it was disclosed. No, all bug bounty. I guess you can't really sort this in a way that I think makes sense, but here are some, um, here, here are some things that have been, um, opened against or, you know, publicly disclosed about things that are happening within the cluster. And if you look at that security announce list, you're going to get to see the same events, but I think it's actually probably a pretty good way of understanding what's ha what's coming. And um, there'd be a coordinated disclosure. So if you're following the security list that is in the notes, then you would still be able to see this. But also this is kind of like where you're seeing, uh, this is where folks that are actually doing the work of trying to find vulnerabilities in Kubernetes are going to Make that announcement and so let's just take this top one here for example node validation admission does not observe all old object fields the validating admission controller the admission webhook for node objects is passing old object fields incorrectly on admission review requests it's identified this was an interesting one because their theory the premise is that you could Potentially allowing users to bypass validating admission by updating node labels, chains, and others, which is a, an interesting attack surface. And they created a validating webhook, and they created a dummy, and they created a potential 
issue location. So this is a great example of an expo of a um, vulnerability documentation like that actually provides experiments or it provides actions and really explains the impact of a vulnerability that has been put out. So I thought this was really well written and really well, um, really well done here. And then, you know, as I was saying before, so this was resolved as a CVE. This is the CVE here. And again, if you just go to that uh, information um, within the CVE document, there'll be a link to Kubernetes Security Announce, which is the group that I usually check every every time we log in here. And this is where you can actually see like what this issue was rated as, uh, what the affected versions were, and what the fixed versions were. And so this particular um, piece was actually exposed and fixed. So good stuff. But anyway, more interesting information to go look at. Super uh, CNCF things. I wanted to talk about, I always check the cube weekly for the previous week to take a look and see what's coming or what will be announced. And what is happening this week? CNCF programs, on, online programs for this week. We have Kubernetes clusters need persistent data by James Byrne of Storage OS. And then that tweet that we were just watching for, or we're just talking about from Celeste Hogan. And then there's some good technical articles talking about um, Prometheus Definitive Guide. Interesting. So digging into the Prometheus operator by Nadad Desai from InfraCloud Technologies. Kubernetes CI CD by Alex Chaikas from Ubuntu and SQL Commenter merges with OpenTelemetry. Interesting. I hadn't seen that one yet. Nimesh Bhagat from Google Cloud. And then we have Daniel and John John doing a sneak preview of the KubeCon talk. Should be pretty fun. Allows you to describe, so sub subscribe to events for push and pull operations, serves as a UI to view them. Oh, I mean, that should be a really interesting talk. So if you're, if, and, and I think that will be pre-recorded. So likely you'll be able to see that one both virtually and in person. So we'll see how that works out. Upcoming events, there'll be Kata and Arm, a secure alternative to the SG space. Building an HA control plane for Tinkerbell. Oh, wow. By Jason, my good friend, Jason Didabiris. That should be a fun one. That's coming up on the 15th. Hasn't happened yet. Two more days. And then on-demand seminars, moving from CLIs to control planes with cross with crossplane. Somebody else from crossplane, Victor Farsik, and using CSI snapshots. So that's what's coming in the CNCF community. Definitely check those things out if you're interested in them. And then one of the ones I also really liked was this blog post by my very good friend Scott Lowe, um, who gets into uh, Envoy configuration. He's talking about how Envoy works, what you're configuring. And how and how the and how those bits of it work. So if you're interested in Envoy and the way that Envoy integrates with Service Mesh, this is probably a pretty good read on the Envoy piece of it. I thought that was a pretty good article. All right, now it is play time. Let us get started. All right. So last week we did a lot of talking about the. Um, Enhancements. Oh, and I just learned something new. I wonder if I click here. I want to see if this works. Just bear with me for just a moment because I think that it does. If it doesn't, then I'll be kind of sad. But I figured out that there is a new short path features dot case. Oh. That in. Uh, it doesn't work. So features goes to issues. Hmm. I was hoping that was a little easier or more intuitive, but I don't see how it works right now. My phone's ringing. Not today, buddy. All right. Ah, so that's how it would work. So if you know the issue number, like 2579, for example, then you can actually go to that issue by going features.k8s. Oh, 2579. Yeah. 
So if you are aware of a uh, like this particular issue, this is the Kubert, this is the enhancement for pod security admission, which is a thing that we're going to be exploring in hand today. Um, these are the assignees to it, and this is kind of the work that's ongoing. Uh, if you know that issue, then there's actually a, a short code that you can use to get there, which I only just recently learned about, which I thought was actually pretty cool. So, let's see. So we talked quite a, little, quite a lot about this documentation last time, talking about like basically how it's going to work, um, what pod security admission is, how do we enable it, those sorts of things. Oh, and actually I just saw an issue go by in the Kubernetes development list, which is on, I usually look for lwkd.info for this. And what they pointed out was this recently merged. And what this does is it actually changes the admission mechanism inside of the API server to enforce pod security before a pod security policy. So if you're in a state where you're running both, then pod security will run before pod security policy. And that enables the, um, the functionality of like audit or warn, right? And we can talk a little bit more about that when we get hands on, but when you have this stuff running, if you have pod security admission running and you have it set in an audit mode or a warn mode, then you probably want to be able to see those things before pod security policy takes over, takes the object and um, and implements it. And so in this case, you can, they, they basically just change the order of, uh, the order of which admission control policies, the ordering of admission control controllers, policies, objects, however they are being evaluated so that pod security would run before pod security policy. So the admission for pod security runs first. Pretty cool. I thought that was pretty neat. It's a good fix. And then we also talk about, okay, so this is actually where we're gonna jump in. My good friend Lachlan Evanson actually wrote this article uh, and I was helping him kind of understand the way that the SecComp stuff worked, but this is actually also just uh, an article that he put together about the very thing that we're going to explore today. And so since some of this work is already done, we're going to dig in and we're going to start here. To keep it simple for our particular environment. So I'm going to jump into my desktop two, pop open a terminal. In the zero zero nine. Let's get started here. So I'm going to do cat. Get out of there. Okay. Now, there are a couple other things I wanted to extend in this, and I want to talk to you a little bit about why and how. Um, and so inside, oh, oh shoot, that's not what I wanted. Um, in the documentation, do, 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 which is here, a part of this documentation talks about, like, if you're in warning mode, get down in here. Mm -hmm. So in pod security admission, here we go. We have audit and warn. And in here it says policy violations will trigger the addition of an audit annotation to the event recorded in the audit log. Warn. Policy violations will trigger a user facing warning, but otherwise be allowed. And so as we define policy um, and enforce that policy in a given namespace, then we'll be able to see like the three, the three different modes here. And that's what, we, that's what I'm planning on covering today. But in here specifically, it calls out the need possibly for being able to see what's happening in the audit log. And so I wanted to extend our kind configuration to support an audit log so that we could actually see that. Um, and fortunately, I have done this work before 
in the form of a gist. And so I wanted to actually just share with you what I was doing in that gist. And then hopefully that will give us the ability to export our audit log. And then we'll be able to actually see the audit event as it is annotated when we go into audit mode. And we'll be able to see what that audit security event looks like. So for each mode, OK, so this is actually a configuration of the object itself. OK, so inside of here, this is a gist I put in, uh, gosh, 13 months ago. So a year and a month ago when I was playing with auditing inside of Kind. You could even see even the API version is an older version. I think now we're on a, a different version of API. Um, and this is a cribbed from the out cold, out cold solutions monitoring Cades v4 audit document, which is probably good enough for us. Do not log from the collector. We probably don't need to worry about that piece of it. And then there's don't log node communications. Don't log read only URLs. Log config mapping secrets. Sure. I can catch a little more than the out cold. Ah, okay. There we go. So then here's our kind configuration. So these are this is like basically what the audit what the um, the auditing a uh, file will look like when we're configuring auditing and auditing inside of Kubernetes. And then the other file here is our kind config that leverages um, that, that makes the advanced audit.yaml file available to the API server. So that the API server can actually use that audit policy file and specify an audit path. And then that'll make it so that we actually have an audit log that we're able to view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and copy. We're going to build a kind configuration that supports both pod security, pod, pod security admission, and also the, um, the audit logging so that we can see those events. So bear with me. And as we work through this, and then we'll be able to actually see exactly what that looks like. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to come over here. I'm going to go down here to the bottom just for a second. Okay. I'm going to paste all of this in here. And then we're going to do some handy cutting and pasting. We can actually just do a relative path now, which is cool. Audit.yaml, read only true, type file. But this is doing what this line right here with the extra mounts is doing. Is it saying for the container path in the control plane node at this path, Etsy Kubernetes policies adv audit.yaml, I want you to make a copy of this file, which is local dot slash adv audit.yaml, make it a read only file and copy it as true. Now, what this does is it makes the assumption that um, actually this makes it so that the file is available on the underlying node. So if I were to Docker exec into the API server, sorry, into the control plane node, I would be able to see that file sitting on the file system inside the container. But what this does not yet do is make the file available to the API server running inside of that static pod container that kubeadm stands up. So that's where the next piece is going to come in. Get rid of that. I'm going to get rid of that. So then we have our control plane node with this file made available. And then here is where we're going to make our kubeadm configuration patches. I have to look to see if this is correct. I think it might no longer be. So I think we have to see what version is actually the current version. And the way that we can do that is we can go back to our browser. We can go dot
you know what? Path relative to it's path. The path is going to be relative to the um, where you're actually running the kind, um, the kind create cluster command. Oh, doc. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So our current API version looks like v1 beta 3. Okay, so it's v1 beta 3. Fifty and newer can be used to migrate from 1 to 2. 122 plus no longer support v1 beta 1 and older APIs, and but needs to be supported v1 beta 3. So that works for us. Thought that had changed. Configuration. This metadata name thing is just giving it something to actually parse against. And then here we're here's where we get things that make things interesting. So for the API server component, we're going to pass some extra arguments to that binary. We're going to set the audit policy flag or file to use our policies of audit.yaml. We're going to set the log path var log Kubernetes cube API server audit log, and that'll be made available on the underlying container. And then the format for that will be JSON. And then here we actually make the file available to the API server binary. Yeah, inside my laptop. And where it will be inside the Docker node will be at that path, at that container path that we specified. And we're going to look at that here in just a second once we get this wired up, right? And so this path, host path, will be on my laptop. And container path, container path will be inside of the container. Does that make sense? So in the extra volumes made available to the API server, right? We're going to pass in a couple of extra volumes. We're going to create a, a volume that says host path mount path Etsy Kubernetes policies, and this will actually give us access to that file that we copied into the node. And we're going to make that file available to the API server inside of its container file system. And then the other piece is where we're going to put those logs. So we called out above that it was var log Kubernetes. So we're just going to mount that path on the underlying container into the container that's running kube API server, um, where that path will be. And this is read only false, that's directory or create. So in theory, we should have everything we need to be able to turn on both pod security policy, which is all we had to do here was the feature gates pod security equals true. Um, and then in the nodes on the control plane, we're going to add this advanced audit.yaml, which we still have to create on our local file system. And then we're also going to pass in some configuration options to the, to the API server so that the API server can enable auto logging. So I'm going to go ahead and vim av audit.yaml. insert mode and then we're going to go back over here to our gist nope yep i'm going to go ahead and grab this whole thing and come back over here and drop it in there now i think oh you know what that's probably not right anymore either I'm assuming this is V1 by now, but let's check. Let's go up a 121 cluster real quick and just take a look at that. Um, I'll show you how to actually validate that stuff because, like, sometimes I also don't know. So. Pretty sure it's v1 now but let's take a look actually we could also just bet we could also just bet it here so
one. So they apparently have some stuff in V1 Alpha 1, some stuff in V1 Beta 1, and also there is actually now a V1. Likely what we're doing will fall into the V1 category. So we should be good there. We're going to leave that as V1. Also, you can do Q. Well, explain audit. Yes, yeah, it's probably just going to only be known about within. I thought that audit was actually something that was serviced in the API, so you could actually. Oh, no, that never happened. That's right. I was thinking maybe it would actually be something surfaced in the API because I thought we were talking about like dynamic audit for a while, but I don't think that actually ever materialized. And so it's actually not going to be known here. It's going to be known in the code base. All right. So here is our audit YAML. We have set it to audit.case.iov1. It's a policy. Here are the rules that we care about. Should be enough to get it done. I'm going to do kind. Delete. Name equals check. And then we're going to go ahead and bring up our new cluster with all of this configuration stuff and create cluster config equals demo, and then version or uh, image equals image string from that blog post. Where is that blog post? Too many windows. I chuck some of these. You know, I'm, I'm going to do exactly that. Chuck all of these. Mm -hmm. And inside of Lockie's blog. We want kindest node v1220 because that's actually where the feature shows up before this the feature gate will apply to nothing so we'll paste that in there enter Oop. something happened here field type not found in type v1 alpha form mount alias mm. that's changed. It's no longer a type. Now, will it fail or will it work? Bum, 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 ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. We are making some pretty significant, interesting changes to the um, to the control to the control plane configuration, so you might get to see some troubleshooting on the Kubadium side. Oh, hey, control plane started. Whoop whoop. Worker nodes. I don't think I actually did anything to the worker nodes, so that should be started fine. It was the control plane that would have messed up if we had messed it up. I can't believe we got that in the first try. That was kind of amazing. Feeling kind of chuffed. Okay, sweet. So now we think we got everything worked out here. Let's just go ahead and validate our assumptions. So I'm going to go ahead and Docker exec ti kind control plane dash. And then we do ls Pepsi Kubernetes policies. There's that file. And then if we do var log Kubernetes. Oh, that doesn't look right. Mm. 
Yeah, that's not that's that is where I put it, right? Cat. So this is where, because I was doing kubeadm configuration patches, we can look at the kubeadm configuration file that was actually resolved and verify that the changes we made show up in that resolved file. The way that we do that, if you can just cat um, kind kubeadm.com, this is where the files would show up. If they were going to show up, this would be where they would be. So we're going to cruise on up here. There's kubeadm v1 beta 2. There's our feature gate showing up, so that's working. You know what? I don't see this stuff showing up. I think we have missed the boat somewhere. kubeadm there's V1 beta 2. Yeah, I don't see it here. And if I do SE Kubernetes manifests cat kube API server. Nope, that did not work. I see no auditing flags. So this failed in a silent kind of way. Interesting stuff. It's probably one of those things, you know, there's this thing that um, happens with YAML and that's uh, where it is like, it will ignore stuff that is, that is not, that is missing. Oh, see, I'm forward. This is V1 beta two, not V1 beta three. In this configuration, we can see that we're using. Yeah, that's what's happening. Okay, so take a look at that again real quick, and then I can cement this to make sure that we have it right. Cat. Cubeadm.com. You can see that the configuration that was passed to kubeadm was of this particular version, kubeadm.k, it's the IO v1 beta 2. But in our configuration, we were passing a patch to v1 beta 3. And v1 beta 3 is not a configuration that is being passed to kubeadm, and so it is failing silently because it doesn't know how to match. So I go back into my kind configuration, and I change this value to Kind master. Eight cluster. And then we'll see if it works. So we thought we got away with it, but we didn't quite get away with it. We're going to see if we get away with it this time. While this is loading up, I'm going to actually go ahead and open up another terminal and do cube can actually. Control plane. Hey, control plane started. Kind video.com. Hey, there we go. Now we're seeing it show up. Much better. Okay. Is there a way to tell kubeadm to use beta 3 in the kind config? I think we have to rely on the machinery that kind is using. So likely in a, some version of kind that is forward, that it would use that next version. Um, Alternatively, we could do a thing where we generate the kubeadm.conf ourselves and overwrite the destination in that API server with just a complete kubeadm file that it would use, right? And so if we wanted to if we wanted to take like an example kubeadm configuration like you see here and um, make that like 
this is the only hard part, right? Is this local IP advertise address? Because we need to know for sure that that would be the IP address that it would resolve to. But if we did know that, that we knew it would be the, the second Docker container running or what have you, then we could actually go ahead and make this change. Also, there's a default that would probably be okay here because there's actually the only the one IP address on those nodes. So we probably don't need to specify node IP here. It's just being passed because of the way we generate, we're generating the configuration. I hope that answered your question. I know that's not a super easy, uh, I know that's not a super easy answer, but that is one way that we could be doing that. Okay, so let's go ahead and validate our assumptions again. Looked like it worked, but I wanna jump in here and take a look around. Find control plane, touch. And we'll do cat or tail minus f var log kubernetes. Hey, ho ho, ha ha, perfect. It's working. All right. So we do have a working audit log. We do have a working Etsy kubernetes manifest to the API server. So it's actually. So inside of here, we should be able to see our audit line. And that is pointing at that correct file. And so everything is working like a champ. All right, so our cluster is stood up. Let's play with it. Dig in, should be fun. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this, uh, this configuration, I'm gonna put this configure. actually, you know what, let me just, before I say I'm gonna do it, why don't we just do it? Then I'm going to jump over here into our This Week in Cloud Native. Go into edit mode. Whee! Okay. Those who want to play along at home, this will be the avaudit.yaml. And this will be hide.conf.yaml. Over here, grab the yaml. Okay. And then it and and big in here, have our relative. So, and create cluster where these files are located. equals Boink. okay so I could actually get you to the place where we are and verify log or auto log yes. 
exec control plane log Kubernetes. All right. Let's dig a little further down into the rabbit hole. So the next thing I want to do, I'm going to go back to this blog post because some of the work that was that was done here is already done. Warns about the baseline pod security pin to v122 policy on the test of this. Neat. <laughs> All right. So the way I'm interpreting this, when we go back to the documentation, um, remember we have a couple of different modes, right? We have a warning. We have a mode for baseline, a mode for restricted, and the baseline one is pretty permissive, and the restricted one is not quite as permissive. So in restricted, for example, you can't run a container as root, but in the baseline one, you're pretty okay with it. So this is a great example. Let's give this a try. Let's let's actually validate this in our configuration and see what this looks like from our side. And then we can kind of play through like what that would look like. So we'll do it'll create NS next test. Do I have KNS? I do. Good old. Is it label or annotate? Label. Let's go ahead and do that bit. Baseline, oh, label, test, test, and then we'll do warn. Restricted. We'll also do audit. Labels. These are the labels that I have specified on this namespace. I've set the Kubernetes.io metadata name. Oh, that's actually already done for me. But then pod security Kubernetes.io audit restricted pod security Kubernetes.io enforce equals baseline. And then pod security Kubernetes.io warn equals restricted. So now I should be able to get warnings. I should be able to see that in my audit log. Um, and I should get user facing warnings about. Um, manifests that don't line up with a reality, but they should still allow the creation of a pod. So if I were to do kubectl deployment, I'm already in the nginx test namespace, but nginx equals nginx stable for replicas equals three, for equals 80. Enter, and I do see a warning, a user-facing warning. Would violate the latest version of the restricted pod security policy. Allow privilege escalation is not equal to false. Container Nginx must set security context. Allow privilege escalation equals false. Unrestricted capabilities. Container 
Nginx must set security context capabilities drop to fall. Run as not root is not equal to true. Pod or container Nginx must be set must set security context run as not root. The seccom profile must also be defined. Runtime default or localhost. That's pretty cool. I mean, I think that's actually pretty useful for like a, the developer side of things. Like you'd be able to see that in your log if you were doing something like a, um, a mechanism by which you were deploying automatically using CI or something like that, then this mechanism would actually probably surface in your logs and you'd be able to see it. Neat. But I also want to see the audit log and see if we see that same output or what the audit event looks like. So let's jump in and see. So let's do Docker exec TI. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is actually not going to deploy. <laughs> I just noticed a typo. Whoops. Well, doesn't really matter too much. We should still be able to see the event because this is an admission, not in runtime. So it, that it doesn't deploy is almost beside the point. So kind control plane nginx log Kubernetes audit dot log. I'm going to actually kick this to the queue. Oh. In that part. There we go. So this is neat. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. So actually that last match gives me kind of what I'm looking for. So this is the event for So authorization.case.io decision was to allow. The reason was that there was nothing that blocked it. Pod security, Kubernetes.io slash audit, allow privilege escalation. So this is annotating this piece of it. And it basically gives us the same output that we saw before. So that's actually pretty cool. But let's look at this entire event so we can see kind of like what this looks like. So here's the response object for this deployment, right? This is coming from the API server being, and it is a response to whatever the command line client is that created this object, right? It's a kind deployment, apps v1. So this is in line with what we saw previously in the documentation where now we can actually warn you about the object as it is created as part of a deployment. We don't have to necessarily wait for the pod object to get created. And this is different than the way pod security policies work. Pod security policies only take effect and only manipulate pods themselves. So you could very easily end up in a state with pod security policies where you uh, just wouldn't see pods deploying, but the deployment object would be accepted by the cluster. 
And so that was kind of leading to a state where sometimes it was hard to actually debug or understand what was actually happening in the lifecycle of that deployment because of the way that it would be manipulated, because of the way it would materialize inside of pod security policies. So your light, your flow would be, you know, you already have a pod security policy defined inside of your cluster, your user or whatever mechanism you're using to deploy inside of the cluster that would create those pod objects has access to that pod security policy. If the decision that that pod security policy would enforce is to deny the admittance of that pod, then what happens is that the pod itself just will never be scheduled. It will, it will never show up as a pod object inside of etcd because the object was denied. Um, but you would still get the replica set. You would still get a deployment object. Those things would be created and they would be allowed in because they're not part of the way that pod security policy would enforce admission. Pod security policy would only enforce the pod object itself. In this case, though, with pod security admission, this is a different, this is the new version stuff, right? The new stuff actually can evaluate the deployment object itself. And it can actually look at that object and give you feedback based on that information, right? So this was the manager for this was kubectl create. We just saw that. Here's some information about what was being known, what's known about it, or information basically that it is evaluating against. There's going to be three replicas. This is what's in the configuration. We can still see our typo here, whatevs, right? And then we can see that this object was annotated. Authorization case to IO decision is allow. And then here is the pod security audit annotation. Now, I don't think that the the nginx object is annotated with the same information and we can see that it is not so there's no annotation in the object itself with this information that's just annotated to the event we can see of course that the image pulled back off right because that did not work There we go. I was looking for so Put that in there. Stable. What this does is it actually just as a quick hack will change the image use nginx stable instead of nginx, and now I should be able to see those things deploying. Kettle set basically just gives me the ability to set particular things about a deployment or a daemon set or what have you. And then the interesting thing was, even though that was being set, we still saw the same would violate latest version of restricted. And that is being configured by, by what's configured at the namespace level. So we have things working. We're able to see the audit events. We're able to see the user space feedback. We're not getting any feedback on the object itself, which I think is kind of interesting. All right. Yeah. Validating. I don't think you'll be able to see it here. Yeah, because it's in the configure. It's in the code. So that is a start. Let's go back to our docs here. So we've got auditing working. We're able to see the event, which is pretty cool. 
there were some questions that were brought to me um, by RW. Which might be you, Russ. Is that you, Russ? Or is that somebody else? So it'd be interesting to see applying policy on top of existing pods and see what it does. Once an old non-compliant pod restarts, it might not come back up. Press app down. That's true. If you're in a restricted mode, then it would break things. Although deprecated, pod security policies are still are still supported through 1.25. How badly can you break a cluster with both enabled? I think that that would be fun to play with. I'm not sure if that's going to be in scope this time. But I imagine that because now pod security policies, sorry, pod security admission will be enforced or be evaluated before pod security policies. Um, and so the way that you would break things, it's probably likely that the box of razor blades is going to be in pod security policies, not in pod security admission. And the reason I say that is because pod security admission, it's only validating it's only looking it's only um, validating the specs and making a decision whether to allow or deny based on its evaluation and against the policies that you've defined. Um, whereas pod security policies do quite a lot, quite a lot other of other stuff. Like they might also do things like enforce um, the configuration of things or mutate the pod spec itself. So likely you're more likely, I, I would say that you're more likely to run into trouble with pod security policies than you are with pod security admission because pod security admission is either you're going to allow or deny and pod security policies are going to be the thing that mutate and change or enforce the change in configuration. That's the way I understand it. But I want to see one of my one of my um, explorations in this effort was to see are, are we doing any 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 sort of mutating and I don't think that, that is the case. Do duplicates of mode cause an error or is it the last one declared or maybe first? So in our example here kettle get ns test show labels so in this case the mode is somewhat duplicated i don't think that we can create two labels with this with a different value so i couldn't do like pod security kubernetes io audit equals one but let's try it Kettle label NS NPS. Yeah, there's already a value. We can't really do it, but we can overwrite it. So if I wanted to change the key, if I wanted to change the value of this one key, then I would have to actually. I would have to I would have to change the value of it. And another question would be, can I pass multiple options to audit? Right? Like, could I pass restricted and baseline? I don't know that that would be a valid configuration either, but it might be kind of fun to see. Doesn't take a common common delineated list of things. All right. So I think that would not. I don't think that would work. So two duplicates of a mode. So I assume pod security is cluster wide. So you couldn't have different rules per node. So this is admission, and it happens at admission on objects like deployment or daemon sets or pods or those sorts of things. And because it's admission, it doesn't actually matter. Well, the rules would not apply differently on different nodes. They would apply differently on different namespaces. And you could actually also have sets of exceptions around things like what user is creating an object. Like you can actually, and this is actually one of the things I wanted to explore next was 
sort of the exceptions because you can make it so that like a given user has the ability to deploy a pod that is of a particular enforced set and a particular um, in a particular namespace. You can like overwrite it. But how the nodes CRI would or how the node would enforce it would be would be the same regardless of the node, I think, because it's all happening kind of at the admission layer. Yay. I'm glad that's you. I think you'd only pass me. Yeah, exactly. I think that's right. That's what I thought too. All right. If I understand it right, big if. There are only three built-in policies. That's right. And they can't be changed. Also true. Privileged, baseline, and restricted. Is there any way to add your own or is it too soon? And that's why there are links to other projects. Yeah. So the way this has shaken out over time is this. Um, initially, the concern was the reason there's even a pod security admission piece is that the API for pod security policies has grown somewhat out of bounds, right? Like there's just so many things you can configure and, and it's not, it's kind of difficult to configure it, kind of difficult to, to test it. And so it became a thing where we're trying, where, where it became very difficult to actually um, manage that API's growth over time. So that led to the deprecation of pod security policies. However, um, Liggett stepped up and or Jordan Liggett stepped up and he said, you know what, maybe we could just make a much simplified, a much more simplified API for what is happening here. Wherein you might have like the three major models that people use privileged baseline and restricted. And those are following the best practices that we define in the pod security, um, in, in the pod security document. And that you would be able to then just apply those things to given namespaces and get information back to users that say, this is not going to work in a restricted mode, or this is not going to work in a privileged mode or what have you, and, and give them a feedback loop that way, but just create a much simpler API that only fits a specific set of use cases. And if people need more than that, then they can actually define that more than that in OPA Gatekeeper, Keyboard, and Caverno, et cetera. And I honestly think that's the right move, right? I feel like we have to have something in place for the project itself. And if that's something that is in place for, for the project itself should follow the best practices that we're describing as a project for how to secure pods and containers inside of your Kubernetes cluster. But to provide like the entire configurable surface that pod security policies provided was, was arguably like too much. It was arguably too difficult to actually maintain over time. And so I think, honestly, this is probably the right decision. So that's why there are only the three and why they're not mutable, why you can't change them. Um, and I don't, I don't suspect that they'll be changeable in the future, but I guess we'll see how that evolves over time. But other than getting the feature flag enabled, should this pod security policy admission mechanism work on cloud providers like GKE, QKS, AKS, once they upgrade their services to offer Kubernetes version that is compatible. I believe that is the case. Yeah. It should just work. The way this would evaluate, like, I mean, I imagine once it becomes default, might be kind of interesting to understand how the, how the, how the um, graduation plan would work, right? So if you, if we go back to our notes and we go back to that, um, that cap, Two, five, seven, nine, or what have you. Mm 
Oh, neat. There's a pod security evaluations metric on the API server. Oh, that's cool. And it's actually broke. Well, okay, let's just go look at that real quick. We're going to take a quick sideline. And because we already have like some that have been allowed, we're just going to look at like some of the metrics that are exposed here. So let's just look at that real quick. So you can all get raw. Raw metrics on security. So I'm going to look at the metrics. Hmm. Did I look at the metrics name wrong? Pod security evaluations should be there. There's pod security policies. Maybe the maybe the metrics aren't quite implemented yet. So I don't see them here. It doesn't look like the metrics are in place yet, unfortunately. You know, one of my other commands, one of my other favorite commands in this, I, I'll just share it with you because I, I always thought this was a super interesting one. The object counts. Like one of my big takeaway commands from the raw metrics. So I only have the one API server. And what I'm doing here is I'm querying the metrics endpoint on that API server using kubectl. So I'm doing kubectl get dash dash raw, which tells, which which means that I'm just going to make like a raw get against the Kubernetes API at a pass. And I know that the slash metrics um, pass is just hanging right off of the root directory inside of the Kubernetes RESTful API. So if I can do kubectl get dash dash raw metrics, then I'll be able to see those metrics that are relevant for this API server that I'm connected to. If you have multiple API servers, you're going to see multiple different outcomes because each API server is its own entity, and they might have they might have different outcomes for some of these values. Now, likely they'll all agree on this one, but it's an it's still an interesting argument. If you're if you're talking to a load balancer that talks to multiple API servers, you're likely to see multiple API servers for sure. However, this is one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most interesting metrics that we expose at the API server. And what it is, is it's the SCD ob object, SCD object counts. And you can see like what those actual objects, object counts are inside of the Kubernetes cluster. So we can see there are 43 secrets, um, secrets defined. There are 42 service counts. There are two services, the zero stateful sets, one storage class. I mean, you can see like all of these different objects. And one of the ones that's really interesting is this one, right? So here are, there are 107 events currently stored in etcd. If I do kubectl delete events a all, we taking all the events, throwing them all away. If I do that same, Object again, and I look for events. So waiting for it to converge. Oh, maybe it's because of compaction. Maybe it's because of the cache. Interesting stuff. I would have expected that to update by now. Interesting. That goes. Okay. A few seconds for for um, for the 
exported metric to change. But yeah, I mean, what this can tell you, this, is, this can actually show you like where things are likely to go sideways soon, right? So you can do things like monitor the number of namespaces, you can monitor the number of nodes, you can monitor the number of pods, the number of events that are currently stored, all of those things, and you can kind of see where your problem is. And so if you're seeing experience, if you're experiencing a problem like, you know, my Kubernetes cluster is really slow, and I want to understand like what's where it's spending its time, one, one way to see that is this information here. And then there's also, okay. maybe it's duration, REST client request duration. Request latency in seconds, broken down by verb and URL. So here's another example. These are calls to the API scheduling case.io piece. And then I think this is neat because it's a um, it's bucketed, right? So you have the value, you have values broken up by category. So what we're looking at here is a Prometheus histogram. Um, and for that bucket, they're broken. The, that means that the, the value of how long a particular call is taking is broken up by uh, buckets. So we have 0.001 seconds, 2 seconds, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. And when you're evaluating this, what you're looking for is where the event is showing up in the set of buckets that you have, right? So if you're looking at the histogram to say, um, in this particular query, all of the queries are being resolved in about the 0 0.064 bucket for resolution. It means they're not taking 128 and they're not happening any faster than that. So if we look for like something that actually has a little bit, a few more requests, we might be able to see some more interesting outcome. Here we go. Here's another one. So getting the namespace, getting the namespaces of the cluster. There have been seven requests to get that information. Um, three of them were responded to within 0 0.002. Three more were responded to within the 0 0.004 time frame, and one of them was responded in the 0 0.008 time frame. And so, if somebody were to say that kubectl get namespaces is taking a long time, then we would start seeing things. We would start seeing things graph up to like a maybe a half a second or longer. Yeah, that's reading all the types from etcd that the API server cares about. Not, I mean, there may be other stuff in etcd that it's the API server doesn't care about, but it's about the objects that it's, the etcd itself considers that it's in it, that it manages, right? And so, um, yeah. It doesn't store the metrics key in etcd. I believe it's actually What's happening is that the metrics code inside of the API server is evaluating the number of objects inside the cluster as part of a metric that it exposes over a period of time. And I suspect that it doesn't constantly pull that to get that metric. It's just updating that that metric on a, on a scheduled period of time. And that's where that was actually happening. Because otherwise, it would probably greatly increase the load on the API server if every time somebody hit the metrics endpoint, it had to evaluate all of the metrics. That would take too long. So likely what would happen is what happens instead is that it just evaluates that value um, and then stores it as a response for anybody hitting the metrics API endpoint. 
for a period of time. And then once that period of time expires and it goes back and it reevaluates, it updates the values. Next time you scrape, you're gonna get a different value. But I, I suspect that's actually how that's working. All right, so that doesn't work yet, unfortunately, with not implementing. What are reasonable SLOs? Dependencies, scalability. Oh, hey. How does this feature react if the API server and or etcd is unavailable? So because the admission is happening effectively at the API server, if the API server is unavailable, it would not work. Oh yeah, because it's a label, maybe we could actually manipulate it differently. So let's see if, what happens if we did that. So if I were to do kubectl label, I think I'm getting a kind of a confusing error. What if I change this to baseline? Oh, that's cool. Go back to restricted. Neat. Okay, well, this is, in my opinion, this is a bug. Is it saying the namespaces nginx test is invalid, but really what's invalid is the value that I'm trying to set audit to. So I'm going to open that as an issue because I feel like that's a problem. All right, so back to our questions. Make sure we got everything. We talked about that. Yep, we talked about that. Other than getting, yeah, we talked about that. Oh, great, yeah, I covered this. So I guess the last thing I wanted to cover was this piece here, which I thought was actually pretty interesting. So pod security tests. So this is a project that was built by Jim Boguadia. contains 
test pod YAMLs for each policy type defined in Kubernetes pod security standards. So I thought we'd try this out because it looked like a pretty interesting way. So or apply the baseline or restricted YAMLs by appending the appropriate folder name. So this is actually pretty interesting. So I'd like to try this out. And then that'll probably be our day. So let's see actually where we are. So it's 327 right now. Um, configure a policy instantiation for your cluster like pod security policies or policy engines like OPA and Gatekeeper, apply the test YAMLs, apply baseline or restricted YAMLs by appending the appropriate folder name the created pods. All test pods have the following labels defined, but policy, baseline are restricted, and the control of the value that identifies the security code and the control being tested. You can view the pods for a policy level with this. Well, let's try this out. I mean, I think, I think it looks pretty interesting. So let's do, uh, copy, do, What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new namespace. Oops. It's fine. And restricted. And we'll do KNS restricted. Okay. And we'll do. I have nice. I do. Okay, cool. So inside of here, when I want to deploy this, customize build. Oh, I didn't know you could do it by URL. Well, heck, let's just do that. That's a feature of customize I don't think I've ever used. This is not currently restricted, so all of these pods should be created. That's even working. Who blocked? App armor blocked. Running. Eat. This is really fun. Nadia back. 
about it. Hello, I'm right. on a call right now, so just for a few more minutes. I'll be uncovering some states that you may not have seen before, right? But it says SysCTL forbidden. Some things are in block state. Big error. Some are sitting in container creating still. That is cool. To kubectl uh, label dash n restrict. Then control. Label dash in. Kubernetes IO of course. Rules restricted. What happened? The other questions that came up. Pods. I don't think it'll change anything, but do cube can all delete. I guess because these are all pod specs, I won't be able to just restart them. I can tell there's pod specs because they're by name. So if I were to do the same customized thing. go. Now, in theory, we should see way fewer of these show up. Very few errors output, which is surprising because we're in a restricted namespace now. Oh, because I don't have warnings turned on. So probably a bunch of them just didn't show up. Odds. Well, they all look like they're there. Hmm. 
privileged running. Interesting. Oh, okay, it was running as an out route and it's in policy restricted, so that one should pass. I'm going to do the different label here. Let's have a label to warn so we can actually see the output of stuff again. And I'm going to do that build again. Nope, no outputs. Interesting. That is, a, that is a surprising output. Do um, bus here. Oh. So most of these containers that are being built actually do match the restricted profile. So I guess these are all Yeah. Here you're setting the override, security context, privilege true, run as not root true. And we see the privilege container start up. You. Well, we may dig more into this in the future. Yeah, I hadn't seen, I mean, I have seen sysctl forbidden before because you're actually trying to manipulate a, a, a sysctl that isn't exposed by the API, so by the kubelet. But yeah, it's an interesting state. All right, well, I think that's the end of our broadcast today. So I hope this was educational. I hope, to, I hope folks found it useful. I wanna say thank you for tuning in and I'm really looking forward to um, Keep coming this year. Should be a really fun one. One of the big things I can share with you is that I will be co-hosting with Mr. Dan Pop from Sysdig. I'll be co-hosting eBPF Day at KubeCon, which is a pre-show event. So if you're going to be at KubeCon or if you want to attend virtually, definitely check that out. I'll be co-hosting that with Dan Pop, and that'll be amazing. So definitely check that out. Um, I hope you all have a great week and thank you for tuning in and I hope this was useful and I'll see you all next time. Thank you. Yeah.